Hello everyone. This is Nestehan from COGIST, which is a community where students and professionals from various fields of study gather around to make resources based on cognitive sciences more accessible and provide the students a way of communication with the uh, various events we hold throughout the year, such as the academic cognition, which is a series of talks preferably given by undergrads and master students who are relatively less recognized um, and book cognition that provides an opportunity for professors and students to exchange ideas revolved around a book of choice. And growing up in science, where professors share their lifelong experiences about the academic life. Uh, you can follow our accounts on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and you can also support us from the patreon.com and we truly appreciate your support. Um, today's event, named the Cognitive Webinar, is designed to be online and held entirely in English, aiming for an international audience. We would like to provide a platform, not just for science communication, but also an interaction of academics from all over the world. Today, uh, we're going to listen to Dr. Norta, who is a neuroscientist, a psychiatrist, and a philosopher holding degrees in all disciplines. He is the chair for Mind, Brain, Imaging, and Neuroethics at the University of Otova. He completed his initial training in psychiatry and philosophy in Germany. His research focuses on the relationship between the brain and the mind in, in its various facets, such as how the brain constructs subjective phenomena like self, consciousness, and emotions. Um, today, we're going to listen to his talk entitled um, The Brain and Its Mind, Temporal Spatial Theory of Consciousness. And his talk will last about 40 to 50 minutes, and then we will give a five minute break. Uh, after the short break, we will proceed with the Q&A session, which will also last about 30 minutes. Before we begin, I would like to emphasize on the fact that um, we would like our attendees to ask questions with their microphones and video cameras open if possible, but it's not a requirement. Uh, you can also ask questions from the Zoom, ch Zoom chat as well. So Dr. Nordhoff, please take us away whenever you're ready. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the invitation and the nice introduction. So indeed, um, as you already heard, we are over, our group operates at the boundaries between neuroscience and philosophy, and I deem that necessary to understand, for instance, consciousness. So here in this talk, I present you sort of um, a particular approach to consciousness. You have heard that many different theories of consciousness are around global neuronal workspace theory, integrated information theory, and various others. And you can see the approach um, and something which we really don't know yet is how neuronal and mental activity are linked. We don't know that. We don't know that bridge is like basically two cities across uh, the same river, but we don't know how to connect them. We have a lot of psychological, mental data. We have a lot of uh, neuronal data, but we don't really know how they are related to each other. And you see that already in the lower part here of the slide. The question is here, how can such a device like the brain, like Gray Pipe, gruesome device, it's an orientation on the German philosopher, 19th century, Arthur Schopenhauer, can yield mental, mental features like consciousness. So that's basically how does neuronal activity transform into mental activity? That's the question of my talk. And you might notice the more conceptually oriented people among you might already notice that that's a deviation from the usual question, because the usual question is, uh, here I have a consciousness state, what is the neural correlate of it? Yeah, the two questions are not identical. So the main idea here is really you, uh, most of you probably know this uh, uh, slide, this picture, uh, our mind, what we consciously perceive is only the upper 5%. That's very clear. Um, and whereas the 95% remains unconscious or non-conscious. And <clears throat> the question is, and that I would argue that current series of consciousness just focus on the upper 5%, like here, and and also much of the brain imaging, which is done in cognitive neuroscience, cognitive science, for these deeper levels of the mind, of the and also of the mind, of the brain. So that you see here, the question mark. That's the kind of stuff where I'm going to. Why? Because I consider that to be necessary 
to understand the upper parts or the tip of the iceberg. So basically, my talk is about this uh, deeper dimension. Um, I, the structure of my talk will be roughly this. I will present a theoretical background, deeper layers of brain and mind. Uh, then I will introduce a general overview of the uh, temporal spatial theory of consciousness, uh, dimensions, mechanisms of consciousness, briefly explain the formal structure of the theory uh, without going much into philosophical implications, which is, can be reserved for uh, later, or you can refer to my books. And the third part is really trying to provide some empirical meat to the conceptual bones. So that's where I really become concrete, uh, discuss specific mechanism and the empirical evidence. And I highlight here uh, three of the four mechanisms is temple spatial nestedness, alignment, expansion. You will see what this is about uh, in the subsequent slides. So let me start with the theoretical background. This is very important. Um, what is the theoretical background of the kind of model or uh, the model you have? Let me uh, dwell into that. So one, and I already mentioned that, that we currently have no real idea of a connection between the neuronal and the mental features. So as I said, it's between uh, two little, two cities lying across the same river, but there's no connection between them, meaning there's no bridge. So we don't know how to get from one city to another, meaning we don't know what philosophers would say, what is the necessary connection between neuronal and mental features? What kind of feature in the neuronal activity makes it necessary that mental features are constituted? So, and here, for the philosophers among you, the emphasis is on necessary. Obviously, it's not a necessary a priori, it's not a conceptual entailment, but maybe it's sort of an empirical entailment, which has been in the literature of philosophy discussed as necessary a posteriori. But as I said, I don't want to go into that. I prefer to stick more on the empirical side. So what you see in this slide is really, I think that very prototypically reflects the current situation. On the phenomenon, on the phenomenological, on the consciousness level, we speak of a structure of consciousness. Yeah, it has a field of consciousness, it has a foreground, it has a background, it's intentionality. Yeah, then there's also a dynamic. It's com continuously flowing, it's continuously active, dynamic of consciousness, uh, well expressed in, for instance, William James' stream of consciousness. Yeah, it's a con continuous flow. Our consciousness never interrupts, uh, uh, even when you're not uh, listening to my talk. And then there's also spatial topography. There's a certain a mental topography, a certain organization of your consciousness with foreground, background. So now you would expect that you would need to look for analogous features on the side of the brain. However, that is not the case. What we look for in the brain is we look, for instance, for regions, for networks. For instance, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, global neuronal workspace theory, posterior sensory cortex, IIT. However, that is very different from looking for topography. Topography is a whole brain event, but we look for regions. We look for local activity rather than for global activity. So there's a discrepancy between topography and regions. Topography on the mental side, regions on the neuronal side. Same goes on. Uh, we look for, uh, on the mental side, we look for the stream of consciousness. Instead, we look for static. It remains static. Uh, uh, the content uh, is wrong down there. Yeah, so we look, we analyze the brain in a very static way rather than in a dynamic way. And then instead of structure, we just look for contents, the contents of consciousness. So there's a contingency, maybe just because of our methodological approach to the brain, gap of contingency. Now, how can you uh, resolve that gap of contingency? Maybe that you say, okay, I analyze the neuronal side and the mental side with similar features, meaning I analyze the neuronal side in terms of topography, dynamic, and that leads us to space and time. So that's the main idea that maybe spatial topography, 
and temporal dynamics are shared by neuronal and mental features. And in a larger paper last year, we described that as a common currency. So the concept of common currency is sort of an, uh, an assumption about the relationship between neuronal and mental features that they share certain features, meaning spatial topography, temporal dynamic. And as I said, I will give you examples of that. So this was this paper, what we uh, published last year, is spatial temporal dynamics, uh, the common currency of brain and mind in quest for spatial temporal neuroscience. And much of my talk will revolve around that, uh, topography and dynamic on neuronal and mental levels, and that is also the idea of our theory of consciousness. So that basically the, the background, the search for shared features on the neuronal and mental levels. And that we hope to find in topography and dynamic. So that sets the conceptual background, the model or the theoretical framework for the development of the temporal spatial theory of consciousness, which I now in the second part of my talk want to briefly introduce. So I already said that neuronal and mental features share the temporal spatial dynamics. So now you say, not of what on earth do you mean by dynamic? Yeah, if you, uh, uh, wherever you are in the world, maybe you live close somewhere to the seaside and you see uh, big and small waves. Small waves. Uh, have uh, are less spatially extended and have less power. You're not afraid of small waves. But the big waves, you're interested. As a surfer, you're interested in the big waves because they have a lot of power and they're more spatially extended. So here you see, and I say that's exactly the same what happens in the brain. That kind of dynamic and topography happens exactly in the same. The same kind of dynamic happens in the brain. And here I show you that as you all know, the brain has different, uh, the neuronal activity continuously fluctuates, uh, and that fluctuate, those fluctuations occur in different frequency ranges. They can be slower, they can be faster, meaning the brain has slow, very powerful waves, like here, which you, for instance, measure with fMRI, frequency range of 0.1 hertz, about 100 seconds, and then you have the faster, typically EEG frequencies of alpha, beta, gamma, etc. So I will come back to that. So that kind of dynamic. So if you say we go really back sort of to the raw data with, and we try to look what kind of spatial and dynamic temporal patterns are in the raw data. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, so that we try really to go into the very basics of the data themselves. So, and that's the background for the temporal spatial theory of consciousness. So the idea is basically here uh, that we say of the brain's time and space mediate consciousness and the different dimensions. And that's uh, what we call temporal spatial theory of consciousness. Main idea, you see it down here. The uh, bridge is the gap. The TTC tries to bridge the gap between spontaneous and stimulus related activity. So basically you can have uh, three views about all of this. You can say you're a proponent of resting state, uh, you're a proponent of task-related activity, or you say uh, um, both are int intimately related to each other, meaning the stimulus activity just occurs the task states of the brain, just occur against the background independent upon the uh, pre-stimulus or spontaneous activity. So, and I say that the interaction between the two slash the third view is key. When you look into current theories of consciousness, and we published a larger paper on an overview paper of that last year, not of Lamme, um, on the different theories of consciousness, you see they either uh, stimulus or task related activity, like the integrated information theory, like the global neuronal workspace theory, like the recurrent processing theory, like the higher order thought theory. Or alternative, they are resting state theories, like the entropy theory by Carter Harris, like uh, the operational time and space theory by the finger quotes. However, 
The TTC, one of the, I would say, virtues of TTC, that it really links the two. And I will explain you later about that. Uh, and the second key feature of the TTC, that it really tries to bridge the gap between neuronal and uh, phenomenal or mental levels, and I will demonstrate that. Uh, let me show the key basics of the uh, TTC are four distinct mechanisms. Um, which we call temple special nestedness, temple, and you see temple special nestedness, temple special alignment, and uh, temple special expansion and temple special globalization. So um, that you can see here. And what is important is that each of these mechanisms correspond to distinct dimensions of consciousness. So temple special nestedness to the level, temple special alignment to the form of consciousness. I will explain that. Uh, temple special expansion to the phenomenal experience or the qualia, often called, and then temple special uh, globalization to what is called access consciousness. And you see, we assume different measures, different indices, and sort of different forms of activity, spontaneous pre-stimulus, early, late stimulus, and different kinds of paradigm. So meaning this is a quite sophisticated view, and I think it really distinguishes the, the TTC uh, from the other theories, which basically say one mechanism fits all dimensions. Yeah? The TTC takes a more sophisticated view and say different dimension of consciousness, different mechanisms. So <laughs> now that sets the stage, that's sort of the formal layout and now I present you some empirical support, and I will first uh, go into the temple spatial nestedness. So what is uh, nestedness? You often experience in consciousness a unity. It's a big feature philosophically. This goes uh, back to, interestingly, to Immanuel Kant, who already speak of a unity of consciousness. He distinguished different kinds of unity of consciousness uh, in the uh, current philosophy of mind the one who made the unity of consciousness quite strong is Tim Bain uh, in earlier books. Um, so the question is, where does this unity of consciousness coming from? And my answer, so the unity of consciousness is related to meaning you have different timescales. Let's say when you listen to music, uh, within the same music piece, you have smaller, uh, you have short, you have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, faster and, um, and slower parts, but they integrated and the composer composes the classical music I'm talking here, composes the music in such a way um, that you hear them as in one unity. So what does your brain does or do in order for you to be able to integrate these different kinds of Time scales slow and fast. So this is what leads us to what uh, we describe as nestedness. So let me go a little bit again into the basics. You already seen that. Uh, here is a raw time series, and you look at least con con com uh, completely chaotic. However, you can see there's a certain pattern. There are fluctuations in different frequencies. I already mentioned that. EEG, delta, theta, alpha, gamma, uh, fMRI, infra slow. Uh, this is one to four, this is five to eight hertz, eight to 12 hertz, uh, 20 to, uh, 12 to 20 hertz, and more than 30 hertz. And uh, here's the uh, infra slow, uh, 0.01 hertz to one hertz. So this is what you measure in fMRI. However, and you remember I already mentioned that um, you have that the slower waves, the slower waves are more powerful and the faster waves are less powerful. That's what you can hear, it's a typical frequency plot. You see the frequency on the x-axis, you see the power on the y-axis, and you can see that the slower frequency is much more power than the faster frequency. So these are real brain data. You put a double uh, logarithm on it uh, for the analysis, and then you can, this is important, you can measure the shape of this curve. So if the shape of this curve is a little steeper, it's clear, you have more power in the slower frequencies relative to the power in the faster frequency. If the curve is a little flat, you have less power in the slower frequency relative to the more power in the faster frequencies. So, and you can measure that. And what does this mean? That these different frequencies in their power, they are basically nested within each other. 
So what does nested mean? It's like the Russian dolls, this uh, smaller Russian doll is contained and nested by the larger Russian doll, which in turn is contained and nested in yet another, even more larger Russian doll. And it's the same here with the different frequencies. Uh, the more powerful frequencies, the slow waves, contain and nest the respectively faster waves and so forth. So now you say, and that is what is called scale-free activity. So scale-free means across different time scales, slow and fast. So, and now you can measure that. And now you can say, this is what is called the power law exponent. So the power law exponent measures the shape of this curve, the degree to which it is steep. And you can measure that. And now the question is, how is that related to consciousness? So this is something we addressed in this paper, 2008, uh, 18. Uh, it's a former postdoc of mine, uh, a former uh, doctoral student of mine, who is now a professor in Shenzhen in China, uh, uh, published this in 2018. And what he did, so he did uh, investigate fMRI and he investigated people in anesthesia, uh, in awake and anesthetic state, the same people. And he investigate, remember the power law exponent, the relationship between the slow and fast frequencies. And as you can see here, this is the awake state, this is the same subject in the anesthetic state, you see a huge difference. Now, now let's look at the power spectra. Remember the power spectra where you plot the frequency here, here's a power, this is the awake subject, uh, and you see more power in the slower frequencies, less power in the faster frequency. Now, Look at the anesthetic state, it's completely flat, meaning your original shape or structure of the power spectrum is no longer there. Yeah, so it's completely lost its nestedness. That's not that the uh, faster, less powerful frequencies are nested and contained within the slower, more powerful frequency. Instead, it's completely flat. Imagine this is like the C state, nothing moving anymore complete flat, no change, no waves, complete still uh, water, nothing moves, no dynamics anymore. That's the way you have to imagine the brain in the uh, unconscious or non-conscious state. Uh, I leave this out for the sake of uh, simplicity. Um, so that's what you can, for instance, look at here, down here, the lower part, the temple nestedness. So this is a schematic which uh, will come out in a, a paper soon uh, with a co-author of mine, Federico Silio, uh, who is in Padova uh, in Italy. Uh, and you see here, this is a healthy state. You have different time scales. This is a wakeful state. You have uh, uh, years, months, hours, minute, second, and millisecond. And they somehow all nested within each other. And this one, the larger ones, the longer ones contain the shorter ones and vice versa. And that corresponds to these nice Russian dots. Now, when you start losing consciousness, like in sedation, and this is based on real data, you shift towards the slower frequencies and the, fa the faster frequencies become less. So like here, it's like one Russian door becoming abnormally large in your power spectrum. So, and that's what you can see here. So here you become sedated. Now, when you lose consciousness, you have no different time scales anymore. Yeah, there's no difference. You see, it's no dis differentiation anymore between the different time scales in your neuronal activity. And what does this mean? That also, and you see this flat curve, that also means that in your perception, you perceive everything the same. Your brain cannot make difference anymore. Your brain will not make a difference now between my speech and my much faster hand movement because it lacks uh, the, the tools to do so because neuronal activity is completely undifferentiated. Same here. So you see, and that's uh, what they then perceive, meaning nothing. That's the absence of consciousness. So that's basically what we call temple spatial nestedness, meaning when you are lose consciousness, you lose all your different Russian dots. What remains is at best one big Russian doll, but there's no smaller Russian dolls anymore, meaning there's no nestedness 
anymore. Uh, it's compared to the seaside, it's complete stand still, nothing happens, meaning also you don't perceive anything more, meaning you lost consciousness. So that's, uh, and we assume that this kind of temple special nestedness is related to the level of a state of consciousness. I showed you the previous data about the temple nestedness. Here I show you some data about the spatial nestedness. So what is spatial nestedness? You have a global activity. This is your la largest Russian dot. And then the different networks and the local regions are nested within that global region, within that global brain activity. And that global brain activity, you can measure. In fMRI, you can measure that which was called the global signal and global signal topography. And here, I present you, this is from Tanabe 2020, from our group. So here, uh, we measured the global signal, the degree of global brain activity and its manifestation in networks and regions, uh, global signal topography, as it is called, in different kinds of states. So first, we also included rats in anesthesia in the wake state. Then we in included human anesthesia, fMRI versus awake. Uh, we included sleep data in one and two and three stages of sleep. And third, we included uh, unresponsive wakefulness or coma or vegetative state. And what we could find in all these states, the lower your level of consciousness, the lower your global signal, meaning the lower your global brain activity, meaning your brain really loses its global activity and its distribution across different regions. So that we could use that really as a marker of what is called the level or state of consciousness. So and that means again, vice versa, uh, conversely inferred, that your spatial nestedness, how much the global activity nests, networks, and regions uh, is probably a marker of the level of consciousness. That's why we say the first mechanism, temple spatial nestedness, is key for the level or state of consciousness. Okay. Let me go to the second mechanism. Remember, there were four mechanisms. I will present three of them here, is the temporal spatial alignment and the form or structure of consciousness. When you perceive something consciously, you have a certain structure in your consciousness. It's not homogeneous. You have a foreground, you have a background, you have a content, you have a context. And that kind of organization we call, it's a second dimension of consciousness, it's a form or structure of consciousness. So the current neuroscience of consciousness speaks of two different dimensions, level state and content of consciousness. However, we say a third dimension is needed the form or structure of consciousness. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's a certain, your field of consciousness is organized in a certain way, as I said, with context, content, and uh, different relations between different contents, uh, relations between different time points, and so forth. So that goes obviously back, the form of consciousness goes back again, very strongly philosophically to Immanuel Kant, uh, but also, for instance, you see a lot of that in Husserl in the phenomenology. So, and this is basically here's the uh, mechanism. Uh, and now the question is, what exactly do I mean by uh, temple spatial alignment? So, when you dance to music, you usually synchronize with the music. You beat, you tap the rhythm of the music with your finger or your foot taps the rhythm of the music, and you probably do this automatic and unconscious. So meaning you synchronize your own brain neuronal activity and its movement to the rhythm of the music. And the same happens with other people. When you communicate with other people, you synchronize with their rhythm. And then if you really listen strongly to me, your thoughts will now be synchronized with my speech. And I think I better stop here. Uh, yeah. So basically, you align, you synchronize, you entrain with your environment. And that's what we argue is a key 
component of consciousness. Why? Because consciousness is about you experience yourself as part of the wider world. Yeah? So you are part of the wider world, and with that, you experience consciousness. So then that raises the question, where and how is such a relation of your brain with the world is possible? Temple special alignment as second mechanism in the TTC. Now, how can the brain synchronize? There are different mechanisms around, and I want to present you one here. It's particularly what is called the intrinsic neural timescales. Again, let's li uh, go back to the example of music. When you listen to music, you have different timescales in the music. Slow, fast, they're all integrated. You hear them. But how does your brain pick up these different timescales in the music? Slow, fast, intermediate, etc. The brain has its own intrinsic time scales, meaning it has different temporal windows in its neuronal activity. And these windows of neuronal activity, uh, they can be measured. They're called intrinsic neural time scales, and they can be measured, which what I indicated here, the autocorrelation function or autocorrelation window. How does that work? So here you have time lags. So you have T1, time point T1, time point T2, T3, T4. And now your neuronal activity, what you basically do, you correlate your neuronal activity with, uh, from T1 with time point T2, T3, T4, T5. And then you correlate neuronal activity at time point 2 with neuronal activity at uh, time point 3, 4, 5, and so forth. Meaning, you have a real autocorrelation there. And then, uh, of course, that your activity no longer correlates as much between T1 and T5 when compared to T1 and T2 when it's uh, less temporally distant is clear. So in the degree to which it decreases its autocorrelation, that's what you can measure at the autocorrelation window of the neuronal activity. And you can see in this picture that there's a certain hierarchy of time scales in the brain, meaning it has uh, longer time scales, particular here, part of the default mode network, down here, it has shorter time scale, particular in visual uh, here, uh, uh, motor cortex uh, and other regions. So that is what's called the hierarchy of time scales. I don't want to go into detail about that now, but it's important just to know that the brain has a variety of uh, shorter and longer time scales in its neuronal activity, intrinsic neural time scales, as measured by the autocorrelation window. So that is important. Why is that important? Because it is clear that the brain's intrinsic time scales match and are compared with the time scales of the music. Uh, we see environment. As I said, when you listen to music, you synchronize your own brain time scales with the time scales of the music. You're tapping the beat. Yeah? And then you feel a groove and you become conscious. So that kind of alignment seems to be key for consciousness. And now that is exactly the question, meaning when you lose consciousness, do we also lose our intrinsic time windows? And that's exactly what was uh, probed in a recent study which came out this year by Federico Celio, postdoctoral student in uh, Padova, in Italy, beautiful city, uh, that he investigated these intrinsic time scales, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in uh, groups, in different groups who lost consciousness. So here, he investigated again, remember the power law exponents, the steepness of the curve, but particularly I want to draw your attention to the intrinsic time scales, the autocorrelation window. Each of these lines is one EEG uh, channel. And you see that's basically the time lags across which neuronal activity correlates. And you see the shorter the time lags, the higher the correlation slash the autocorrelation. So you have a, uh, um, a short autocorrelation window, and that's what you measure. 
So now what you can in, uh, see in sleep, you see this here, and this is called auto correlation window, ACW. Um, oops, sorry. Um, that you can basically see, okay, here uh, you can see this is the awake state. This is, okay, this is sleep. Uh, so, and then you, in one sleep, your time scales become much longer. So your slower frequencies become stronger. Your time scales are much longer. You have long windows in your neuronal activity. Then you can go into uh, N2 stage of sleep. Your time scales get even longer. And when you get into N3, the deepest stage of sleep, again, very long time scales. And you can see also for your interest in dreams, you can see it's slightly lower. Here we measure the power law exponent again as before, and you see that the deeper you uh, go into sleep stages to N3, uh, the more you lose, uh, the more your slow frequencies are stronger, and you lose your fast frequencies. Yeah, so that really supports the view that you have very long time windows. It's like a huge window when you look outside. So then you see everything and nothing. Now we come back to that. So here, then we did the same. Here it's the autocorrelation window again in ketamine versus awake and sevofluoran versus awake. And you can see again the time scales become longer. Then uh, Federico Celio asked himself, is this really related to input processing rather than output processing? So then he investigated another group of patients with the so-called locked-in syndrome, which is a very sad condition, where people lose their muscle, uh, their muscle power completely and cannot walk and move, but remain consciousness. So they cannot walk, they cannot speak, they cannot move, but they still have consciousness. So that's why it's called locked-in syndrome. And that's due to a muscle condition, which is called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, uh, you may remember Stephen Hawking, the physicist. So now Federico asked himself, does this abnormal prolongation of the time scales in the unconscious states here in sleep and in anesthesia, does that also occur when you lose your motor function, but your consciousness is preserved? The answer is clear, no. Your uh, uh, autocorrelation window remains completely normal, in those patients who lose their motor functions. So that really suggests that the uh, prolongation, the abnormal prolongation of your ACW, the autocorrelation window, is related to your input processing, to your sensory processing, meaning to your alignment with the external environment. Yeah. Um, so, and I think I make that point here. You could see here. Uh, we, uh, uh, this is a summary slide. You see, when you get sleep, your time scales become much longer. When you lose your consciousness due to anesthesia, your time scales become longer. When you are in coma, in vegetative state, your time scales become longer. When you lose your motor functions but remain conscious, your time scales are normal. And this is basically here. So, if you have an input processing and alignment uh, deficit, meaning like here you're too slow you have too long time scales meaning you lose consciousness if your time scales remain normal uh, it's okay so what does this mean if you have imagine you're looking out uh, you have a large window so you see everything but nothing specific yeah and if the window becomes too large you will not see much anymore yeah, so because if you have a variety of different windows, small, medium, large, very small, very large, you will see much more detail of your environmental context. So that's why I assume when you lose consciousness due to the abnormal prolongation of your time scales, that basically the world becomes one big block. Now, let me show you this one. So this is a figure Federico Cilio did, and it's a very nice figure. And to, uh, so that's one of my... Uh, other postdocs from Spain, Javier, uh, called Federico, uh, not Federico Cielo, but F Federico da Vinci. So, and you can see this here. Um, so here you have sort of the awake state. You have different times of time scale. 
you have a longer time scale, you have shorter time scale, meaning you have the shorter time scale, you can very precise distinguish between these three different moments. And that's what you perceive, you become conscious. So you can temporarily separate this one from this one and this one. So you said, ah, now he starts, then she starts uh, running, and now she runs. Now, if you imagine that your time scales become abnormally long, like when you lose consciousness, this is what happens. Yeah, you blur because you cannot distinguish the first 200 milliseconds from the uh, next 200 milliseconds and from the subsequent, meaning you put everything together. So it becomes blurred. It's like when you uh, ride the bicycle very fast, things become blurred because your time scale cannot follow the fast speed. Here, they cannot follow this speed. They cannot, dis uh, the, the brain cannot distinguish anymore between these shorter time scales because they all put together, they basically all put together in one big pot. It's now basically the smaller Russian dolls are missing. There's only one big Russian doll. So everything becomes the same. Um, so that's basically what we assume to happen when you have abnormal prolongation of time scales. Uh, and now uh, basically that your perception is blurred you do not perceive any differentiation anymore. That's the key point here. So why is that relevant? This is also very interesting relevant. As you know, there's a lot of discussion whether consciousness is present in other species and non-human species. Here, this is a schematic drawing of a paper we just published uh, in, in, uh, in June this year. It's in Nature Communication Biology, where we uh, wrote a, a review, an opinion paper about uh, the brain and its intrinsic time scales are key for in input processing. So here we have different species. We have the mouse, we have the cat, we have the monkey, we have the human. They all have different time scales indicated here. The mouse has only a very limited number of time scales. The cat, some more, monkey little more, human even more. So these are the blue, and you also see the length of the time scale changes. You can see this also here. So now, if you have more time scales, a higher repertoire of time scales in your brain, you're able to perceive and become conscious of your environment in a much more precise way than if you have only one or two time scales. Yeah, and that is sort of here, uh, this is actually epistemologically very relevant. So the degree of black, so these are the time scales of the environment, the world in which we live, the context, and here is the, the discrepancy between the time scales uh, of the mouse and the time scales of the environment. So this is the degree of the black thing here, and you see the monkey has a little bit more time scales, uh, so it has less discrepancy. A human even more has less discrepancy. Now it would be very uh, challenging to think maybe we can build artificial agents where we can implement a more time scales than in the brain. So um, that's basically means here really uh, uh, that's what we mean. So your time scales are key for your temporal spatial alignment in the degree to which you can relate and perceive the world. Yeah, if you have a large repertoire of time scale, you can align in a, in a very variable and adaptive way. Uh, whereas if you have only limited time scales, you can't. Here actually is also a very interesting philosophical connotation. The um, uh, probably some of you may know from the cognitive science. The what is it like to be bad? Thomas Nagel, uh, 1974, and he argues that the bad has a different point of view slash a different consciousness because it can process ultrasonic waves which human can't. And that's a typical example. If you don't have the time scales for ultrasonar waves, you cannot process them and you cannot perceive it and you cannot become conscious of them. So I think it's a very good example. So um, let me go now. Now you might say, yes, we heard about nestedness, the level of consciousness. We heard about the time scale. It's about the alignment. Uh, but we haven't heard anything about the real conscious stuff, meaning the content. So how not of how does the temporal spatial theory of consciousness TTC explain the content of consciousness? So this comes now what we call temporal spatial expansion. 
So let me show you this one. Um, so spontaneous activity, when you look at the brain, we have different layers of different kinds of activity. So you have the spontaneous activity, you have the pre-stimulus activity, you have the early post-stimulus activity, uh, zero to 250, 300 millisecond, and you have the late three to 800 millisecond. So and what is important and already indicated here in the slide, you can see that they're somewhat nested or contained within each other. So the spontaneous activity contains pre-stimulus activity as one its part, the pre-stimulus activity contains early post-stimulus activity and then the lane. So meaning they're somewhat interdependent, this one can impact this one, this one can impact this one. Now the assumption is that for the <clears throat> contents to become conscious, the interaction between this one, the pre-stimulus, and the early post-stimulus is key. And I want to explain that a little bit in the following. This is a busy slide, I'm fully aware. What is important that usually we consider that the post that the task activity or stimulus related activity is basically just added on to the ongoing pre stimulus activity. So it's just it's independent of whether the pre stimulus activity is high or low. The post stimulus activity is always the same. You see this here in the lower left. So you have different levels of pre stimulus activity, but your degree of change by the stimulus is always the same, meaning you have no correlation between pre stim and post stim, uh, and you have complete additivity. So this is the model of additive, and that's a model which is most often presupposed <clears throat> in current studies, uh, also on consciousness. Now, you can have a different model. Depending upon your pre-stimulus activity level, your stimulus might induce stronger changes, like here in the green, or less changes in the blue. Yeah. This is a non-additive, but a positive non-additive, because the higher your pre the higher the activity the stimulus can elicit. You see the difference to this one. Here, it completely doesn't matter which stimulus activity, a pre level you have. Here, it strongly matters, because if you have low pre-stimulus, and your input, your stimulus hits at that point, you will not have any change at all. So now, that's a positive or positive a correlation of positive non-additivity. Now, the negative correlation would be this: uh, <clears throat> that if you have lower pre-stim, your stimulus can induce much more change than if you have higher pre-stim. Look, here's a higher pre-stim does not induce much change. Uh, whereas the lower prism does. So now, <clears throat> and that is what we called non-additivity, and we showed that such non-additivity holds in fMRI, in EEG, this is an fMRI, uh, EEG comes next, and this is also, even on the cellular level, it holds. So here we show that the interaction between pre and post activity is non-additive. Depending upon the frequency, you have either positive or negative post-stimulus interaction. Let me explain you these uh, pictures. So here, the blue one is pre-stimulus low activity. You see it has lower activity, whereas uh, pre-stimulus high activity is the red one. It has higher post activity. Yeah. So the delta picture here corresponds so this one, if you have higher pre you have much higher induction by the stimulus. Whereas for alpha, you can see it's the opposite. So here, the lower pre has much less activity change than the higher pre So this one, sorry, corresponds to this one. Yeah. So meaning uh, that you have non-additive interaction, and that's very important. You will see why that is relevant for conscious contents. 
So now then, meaning your pre-stimulus activity is somewhat also carried over to post-stimulus activity. Yeah, you see this here. So here we looked for uh, what is called trial to try variability. What is trial to try variability it means you have the same stimulus presented in different trials, and across different trials, uh, you have different amplitude. Since it's always the same stimulus, the differences in the amplitude across the different trials can only go be related to the priesthood. And you can see that here. You can see uh, trial to trial variability goes high. Uh, so low, so completely different than the high. But what is important here, and that what you can see uh, here, um, I don't go into detail. I leave that for you if you want interested in that paper. It's this paper in NeuroImage 2021. It's on our website. That you can see that the first 300 milliseconds of your post activity are completely due to the carryover of the priesthood. Yeah, so your post activity, the first, the earliest, very strongly determined by the stimulus, by the pre stimulus itself. Whereas the later part, the uh, uh, post stimulus 300 to 600, there's a stronger impact of the input. So the case I want to make with this figure is that your pre stimulus activity is to be considered when investigating task activity doing conscious content. So what part that the degree of this measure here and the non-relativity content. So this is what I want to present here. So imagine this scenario. You hear a gun, a physical input. So why you hear a gun, um, uh, this is the thing. Any Dr. comment? Sorry, um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, your network is going on and off. You got frozen for a couple seconds and we lost you. Okay, I'm back now. Yes, sorry about that. Okay, no Just problem. Wanted to let you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. I hope it's okay. Okay, um, so it should be fine by now, hopefully. Uh, so you have the physical duration is 300 milliseconds, let's say, of your um, gun firing. And that is this time point, your brain is in that state. But prior to that, your brain was in a certain state, your pre stimulus activity. And let's say during those pre stimulus activity, you mentally imagined a stadium, because maybe you were just running yesterday or you participated in the Olympics, wanted to be like awesome bold, and you run around the stadium. So that was your mental image. Now, at that time point, when you have that mental imagery in your pre-stimulus activity, you hear, the gun, you hear the gun, the shot, and that lasts for 300 seconds. So what will happen, you will integrate this shot into your ongoing uh, mental imagery, meaning the stadium. So meaning, neuronally, it means that your stimulus acti pre-stimulus activity strongly shapes your stimulus evoked activity. Remember, the first 300 milliseconds of your stimulus evoked activity are strongly determined by the uh, pre And there's a non, and the activity here, strong content. Better? Better now? Uh, yes, you're just cutting on and off. Okay. Okay, so there's strong empirical support that your pre-stimulus activity is sort of, and your pre-stimulus mental content is carried over to the post-stimulus. And then the stimulus, here's a gunshot, shotgun, is the, the gunshot is basically integrated with your ongoing mental content. And then what will you perceive? This one. Yeah, because you link the two, ah, there are people running. So what happens 
you basically, and then also you perceive the stimulus, this was only 300 milliseconds, you perceive this one much longer. So that's what we call temporal expansion. And also you expand the spatially, you integrate it within the, uh, uh, mentally within the stadium. So this is what we call temporal spatial expansion of the stimulus, and we consider that to be key for consciousness. Because the actual input or stimulus is integrated within the ongoing activity and its mental content. And by that, the actual input is temporally and spatially expanded beyond its own physical duration. So, and we're currently working on really uh, showing these in details, the degree of temporal and spatial expansion. So I come, uh, so one important feature for theories of consciousness is can we distinguish between the different dimensions, different states of consciousness, like in psychedelics, like wakefulness. So here, and I think the TTC can do that. So we have the four mechanism plotted, temporal spatial nestedness, temporal spatial expansion, alignment, a globalization. And you can indeed see that according to that, based on data, we can quite well distinguish the different states of consciousness here. And one and two, three sleep, uh, uh, wakeful, unresponsive wakefulness, anesthesia, even schizophrenia, psychedelics. So come to the conclusion of my uh, talk, to the last uh, slides. Um, as I said, there are a variety of different theories of consciousness around. Uh, we reviewed eight of them in detail in this paper 2020, which provides a very good overview. And these are theories which, as I said, focus on task evoked activity, like the integrated information theory, global neuronal workspace theory, and others, or focus on the resting state, like the entropy uh, theory by uh, Carter Harris. Um, the and also we have here the embodied theory, I included the predictive coding theory, and you can see the comparison of these theories. However, despite all this progress, these theories leave essentially open how neuronal states transform into mental states. How are they connected? And that's uh, what the uh, TTC uh, temporal spatial theory of con uh, consciousness aims to provide and said, search for what is similar or shared by brain and mind. And that's where the concept of the common currency comes in. And here's a beautiful quote by Nikola Tesla. You probably have heard about him, about the Tesla car, Elon Musk. Nikola Tesla himself lived at the end of 19th, beginning of 20th century uh, from former Yugoslavia to New York. Very interesting guy, highly recommended to look up in Google and Wikipedia very interesting bio. And he said something very nice. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, vibration, meaning you have to go to the back to the most basic features, uh, temporal dynamics, spatial topography. And that's the idea of this uh, approach, which I hope show you that some of the spatial topographic and temporal dynamic features of the neuronal activity transform into corresponding, more or less corresponding, temporal dynamics or spatial topography on the mental level. And you can see, find many of uh, papers and examples, many more than what I presented here on our website. Um, and you can look for details. And the idea is that this uh, concept of common currency can close the gap of uh, contingency, which we currently have in philosophy. It's discussed as a hard problem or as the explanatory gap problem. Uh, that this closes gap of contingency and provide a necessary a posteriori connection between neuronal and mental features. Meaning the claim is that spatial topography of the brain, uh, temporal dynamic of the brain basically entail mental features slash conscious states in a necessary a posteriori way. So that is basically indicated. Why? Because we investigate topography of mental and neuronal level dynamic on mental and neuronal levels. So um, this is the second to last slide. 
So I said that we need a special form of neuroscience for that special temporal neuroscience. Why? Mental features are special temporal features. Yeah, uh, so this is what we have here. So there's a deeper level, there's a brain function, there's a brain dynamic and topography, and that structures and organizes brain function. And that's cognitive uh, neuroscience, affective neuroscience, sensimotor neuroscience, social neuroscience, and here's also predictive coding, it's very content-based. But there's a deeper layer, it's this one. That's what we call uh, so spatial temporal neuroscience investigates the brain dynamic and topography itself and how it structures and organizes cognitive, affective, etc. function. So why do I say that? Because that I deem necessary here, right underlying these different functions uh, as an uh, output of the brain dynamics, you have mental features, consciousness, self, mind wandering, psychotic phenomena, which I didn't even discuss yet, but I leave that for you to ask or to look on our website. And with that, uh, I'm closing. So my hope is that the TTC is a promising empirical candidate for theory of consciousness, and it carries major philosophical assumptions, which I didn't spell out in this talk, uh, particularly for the ont ontological approach, this is spelled out in this book, Spontaneous Brain, 2018, and more on time on a recent book, Court of Time. More details on my lab meet, uh, on my on our lab, uh, on our website. And thank you very much. And I hope you're still all very conscious. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Norta, for your talk. Um, I personally think it was super interesting. And um, we're gonna give a five minute break before we uh, proceed with the Q&A session. So uh, everyone, so we will be back around, um, so it's in five minutes, it's 11.08 in here. Um, I'm gonna say uh, 11.15. Uh, and, and I believe there it's 1815 is the time that we're going to be back for the Q&A session. All right, everyone, it's um, 1115 here, should be 1815 in Turkey. Um, so if anyone has questions to ask, uh, would you mind raising your hand? Um, and I'm going to begin with the question that we have on the chat. Um, all right. So, Evil Eski asked, um, basically, thank you for your great talk. Is there any relation between dementia-related spatiotemporal perception disorders and consciousness studies, such as biomarkers that can be observed on patients' EEGs? Yeah, good, good question. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm happy that you liked the talk. Um, of course, you can have dementia. First, you would need to define phenomenologically why and how consciousness is impaired in Alzheimer's. Um, what I can see, I also worked at some point in geriatric psychiatry, so I saw a lot of these patients. What you can clearly see is that te the temporal range of their consciousness becomes much smaller. Yeah, I mean, the, they have less access to past, they have less access for future. So the, the time span really literally shrinks. And I think that the cognitive changes, let's say in hippocampus and other regions, are probably secondary to a primary temporal deficit in your power spectrum that it shrinks more. But I, I, I'm not an expert in, 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 in memory and, and in hippocampus research in Alzheimer's. But what I can clearly clear on the uh, phenomenological level, you have a clear shrinkage, continuous shrinking of the range of your uh, temporal dynamics uh, subjectively as well as your spatial extension. Um, so your world literally becomes much smaller and less spatial temporally extended. Whether that is met, I know that functional connectivity wise in the brain, they have a decrease in functional connectivity that would go with the spatial shrinkage. Um, yeah, but definitely 
from that perspective, it could uh, meet as a paradigmatic case for consciousness. And also what my hope is, uh, I don't do it for Alzheimer's, but for psychotic disorders, that the spatial temporal markers can serve for differential diagnosis and therapy. I didn't present that here, but we really try to use spatial temporal marker for uh, differentiating spatial topography, temporal dynamic in anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, uh, bipolar. You can see this on our website that we develop spatial temporal models of these disorders and which ultimately I want to use for differential diagnostic and therapy. Um, thank you so much. And I see um, Khan has a question. He can raise his hand, but could you, uh, you can go ahead, basically. So uh, Professor, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, you know, I would like to ask my question by that uh, face to face. You know, the you know the analytical approach you have talked about. You know about the consciousness immensely matters for all of us, in my opinion. And uh, you know, previously this summer I had the chance to look into you know an, another theory about consciousness. You know, the integrated information theory you have mentioned on your slides from uh, Mr. Tononi and his you know colleagues. And you know, when comparing. You know uh, the temporal spatial theory of consciousness you mentioned today. You know, uh, I guess the main difference is you know bridging the gap between the neuronal functions and the mental functions. And you know, I really appreciate that. But there's a question of mine. So uh, you know, through the last steps of your presentation, I have observed that you know we have four dimensions, if I'm not mistaken, of measuring consciousness. You know, uh, in nestedness, alignment, expansion, and globalization. However, when uh, reading about the integrated information theory, having a single metric, you know, uh, a single quantitative metric really seemed like a you know, great idea to communicate between you know, uh, researchers, academics, and so on. And, how, and at this point now, I would like to ask something about, you know, your, your and your colleagues there. Why, you know, there would, was there an obvious reason for, you know, not going with and producing a single metric, but you know, going for four dimensions. So is there an actual uh, you know point in going in this direction? Direction, or you you know uh, you find it more relevant to go with four dimensions, as you mentioned in the slide. Or so yeah, uh, that was my question. It was too long. Uh, no, 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 so it's, it's okay, fair question. So, I mean, this, this is a question which goes in part into neuroscience, part phenomenology, part philosophy of neuroscience. And let me, in philosophy of science, let me start with a letter. So, of course, if you have a model in philosophy of science where you have one principal dimension which explains the phenomenon, great, yeah? Uh, that goes philosophically back to William from Ockham, Ockham's Razor, make as less metaphysical assumptions as possible. So I go with that. Now applied to IIT versus TTC, yes. Uh, the IIT indeed one principle, global neuronal workspace theory, one principle, yes. They're much more simple. However, you overlook what I do in the TTC. What we do in the TTC is also one particular dimension, let's say one particular feature, space and time. But we give concrete mechanisms because one of the problems is, um, of these theories is one for all. And it's clear that over the last 20 years in research, now I'm going to the neuroscience and phenomenology, that uh, it is not just one mechanism that you have different dimensions of consciousness. And my hope is that maybe in 20 years that some of you uh, that say, hey, not of you overlooked this one, you need to have another mechanism. Yeah, great. That's what the science is about. Yeah. But without losing the basic principle out of sight, and that's here the temporal spatial dynamic and topography. Yeah. So the basic principle is spatial topography, temporal dynamic, and for that, I use different dimensions of that, and I link that to different uh, features or dimensions of consciousness. And that is, why do I do that? Because the neuronal results are clear. They show that stimulus, pre-stimulus, and spontaneous activity are key for consciousness. It's clear. That's what the data show. 
you can see the review in the 2020 Not of Lamed paper, and also phenomenologically that you have different uh, features of consciousness, like intentionality, like unity, like qualia, like ipseity, and I even I haven't even touched about that, and you need to account for these differences. So in a way, consider my theory like a tree. You have a trunk, that's the space-time, the brain's inner time and space, and you have different branches, that's are the different temporal spatial mechanisms. In Tononi's case, you just have one big trunk without any branches. So now it really makes more sense. Thanks a lot, sir. Okay. Now I get to know what's your and your colleagues, uh, you know, focus point of events. I really appreciate that. Thanks for yeah. all your time today. Yeah. And you also see that when you read the 2020s in Not of Lama paper, that I do not consider the IIT contradictory. I consider the TTC as a broader framework in which the different theories can be integrated as pertaining to distinct aspects. Yeah, that's the idea. And ultimately, any good theory in science must do that. Uh, Einstein didn't contradict Newton, but he put Newton into a larger context uh, of his uh, theory, yeah, of relativity and so on. So that's important. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Okay. Uh, do we have anyone else that has a question? Uh, I think I may have a question. Uh, okay, first of all, thank you for your, uh, for your talk. Uh, my question will be a rather a philosophical one about ground cognition, actually, because your talk reminded me of uh, especially the, the inactive or extended mind thesis. So, uh, because both the, the both perspectives emphasize the spontaneity of information processing and uh, the, org the interaction between organism and the environment, etc. So, uh, what do you think about ground cognition, uh, ground cognitions actually, and also how do you locate, how do you position your theory uh, in in in, the, in, those in, the, in that spectrum, in that in regard to ground cognition actually? Yeah. What, what do you mean, mean? grand cognition? I don't grounded, know. grounded cognition, like ah, an okay. active, extended, or embedded. Okay. okay. The four E's, the four E's. Yeah. Embedded. Yeah. Uh, extendedness, embodiment, uh, and an action. Okay, um, yeah, good topic. And of course, I, I see the conceptual similarity, absolutely. And of course, the mechanism key here is temporal spatial alignment. Uh, that's really key. So now, however, there's a huge difference and that I'm also a philosopher, so I also answer on that ground. So first look at the data. Remember, I presented some of these data of these locked-in syndrome patients who completely lose their movements. Yeah, and they have locked in their consciousness, but they cannot move, they cannot speak, and uh, if worse, it can't also can't breathe Stephen Hawking. I would consider that as an exa empirical example, which does not support an activism. Because if you cannot move, and you still have consciousness, that should go against Albano and his inactivism. Yeah, because they say that movements are key. So I would say that that doesn't empirical support. Then, of course, you say, you are, conceptually, I'm absolutely, you're absolutely right. My theory is embeddedness. And now the question, what is the role of the body? So that's a key question. The way I understand the discussion, embodiment is always considered as a necessary condition for embeddedness. Yeah, so because you embody, you have a stance in the world and you become embedded. That's Merleau-Ponty, that's Sean Gallagher, that's Andy Clark, and all this line of research. However, I would argue that in order to, for you to be embodied, you need to relate to the world, meaning you link your internal and extraceptive proprioceptive stimuli of the body to extraceptive input from the world. By that, you can locate your body in the world. And by that, you, be, you become, or what you say, a lift body, as the phenomenological people say, as distinguished from an objective body. So in my case, if you want to get me into that, uh, 
I am primarily an embedded theory through temporal spatial alignment. And of course, I can specify the embeddedness is temporal spatial, which is never mentioned. And I reverse the relationship between embodiment and embeddedness, not embodiment being primary driving and making embod embeddedness possible, but the other way around. Yeah, and I do that mostly for empirical reasons, admittedly. So that's why when and, uh, and activism is clear, extendedness is a very cognitive thing. I don't need to tell you that. Um, and that's why I also speak now ontologically very important. Uh, I speak of a world brain relation rather than a world body relation, because I would say the kind of body you mean in consciousness studies, the lift body, is possible due to the fact that your brain aligns to the world and then your body becomes integrated within the world, you get a point of view, you're embodied, and then you can have consciousness. Uh, great answer, thank you. Um, we have one more question in the chat, so I will go ahead and read it. Um, by the way, by the way, I was just wondering that you didn't contradict in the previous answer because I'm used to contradiction to my answers. Yeah, so you seem to have swallowed it. Yeah, so okay, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, in one of your articles on cultural neuroscience, you claim that cultural background is a constitutive part in the brain. However, this TTC approach does not give enough room for the effects of habits, memory, or other social processes in the functioning of the brain. Can we infer that these social event, uh, effects are part of the brain, but not necessary for the explanation of consciousness? Uh -huh. That's very interesting. You cash off my own articles against myself. I love this one. <laughs> it's a good strategy, a good one. Um, yeah. Um, again, I, I hit, it's a fair taken point. Um, I would say that what I call temporal spatial alignment is a key mechanism here. And I think that's really, the nestedness has been done in others, but the alignment really distinguishes the TTC from others. And I just uh, spoke here about the autocorrelation window. We have other measures uh, for that. And it is huge also for me ontological implications because you need the alignment. If you're not aligned, if you do not synchronize uh, with, let's say, the music, or you already know my stereotypical example, you cannot become conscious of that. Yeah, um, that content remains unconscious to you. So the alignment, and that ultimately, I would say, of course, that's social. Yeah, I mean, what I call alignment can be applied to other people, can be applied to music. Let's say just here, uh, when I do this, I'm sure that some of you who uh, intensely listen to me now, they might have similar movements somewhere because you synchronize with me. Why do you synchronize with me? Because that makes you better understand what I'm saying. Yeah, so now for the philosophers among you, we do align and by that I get access to the content. I in the world. I do not need to represent that content because I'm already synchronized. Do I represent the rhythm of the music? No, I synchronize with it and my brain does the job for me. Yeah, I don't think that there's representation necessary. And that would then here on the conceptual level uh, in the answer given that really the environmental context is highly constitutive, let's say about the rhythm your brain will have. And that's what we see yeah. And that will also apply to social uh, uh, processes, it's clear. When I uh, am psychotherapy with people, uh, with some patients of mine, I often observe myself to put on the same gestures as them. I synchronize with them unconsciously. My brain does the job for me. I have no control over that. Um, habits and memory. So I would argue that memories are ultimately spatial temporally uh, founded on this kind of processes, would I say, and habits, yeah, that's a diff it's, it's a difficult story. So I'd probably leave that out because we could go on for hours on that. So I would say that what if you call social, more environmental or ecological or cultural, yes, they are necessary, indispensable for consciousness. Why? Because what is consciousness? You experience yourself as part of the wider world. 
And that's alignment. That is made possible. Consciousness is not in here. Consciousness is not in the body. Consciousness is establishing a relation of yourself relative to the environmental context and therefore to the world. You see that that relation is abnormally altered in psychiatric disorder. So I would reject your last question. All right. Um, do we have any other questions? If not, I will go ahead and ask one. All right. Um, so, um, so you said like you were like interested in like geriatric patients as well. So I had a like question about the developing brain itself, like on children, like how does your theory might explain the developing brain? Um, compared to healthy individuals and into in, in like individuals that had like the altered experience like patients in coma or in like anesthet anesthesia yeah i mean of course so i think one key difference between developing children and, and, and others is really that you have a continuous development of your spatial topography in your brain and your uh, temporal dynamics i'm unfortunately not an expert in that but if you were asking me to investigate children, I would investigate the sp specific topographic features where we know that they're related to consciousness in healthy subject, in, in adult subject, and then see the degree to which they are established in the developing children. And from that, basically have a readout of their spatial temporal scope of their subjective experiences. Um, I think that's, that's the way I would, I would do it. Yeah, same thing here. And I'm sure, I mean, topo topographical features like this global signal topography, which I presented briefly, other features recently core periphery, self non self DMN default mode network versus non default mode network, uh, how much these sort of topographic features are developed in the in the children. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna ask for one last time. If anyone has questions. Going once, going twice. All right, uh, I, I would assume that those are all the questions. And um, I would like to thank you once again, Dr. Norta, for being with us today for your uh, interesting talk and, um, and uh, basically for everything, for your support and everything. Um, and yes, uh, Dr. Nortov just like dropped his like website. If you guys like interested to read further, you know, uh, in his like papers and like, er you can find basically everything there uh, about his research. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I hope uh, you have a like wonderful rest of your day. Yeah. have some like thank you comments at the group chat i mean in the chat as well so thank you good have a good evening good afternoon wherever you guys are bye bye <laughs>